all set to go. So I wanted to do this last year. My name is Chuck Hurley, by the way. My call sign is K1TLI. And uh, this looks like regular black gloss paint. Last year when I did this, I forgot the spray nozzle wasn't on the bottle or on the can, and I couldn't do it. But if you like wrinkled finish or you want to touch up wrinkle finish on something, you can take the paint and you can let it sit. Or you can accelerate the process and watch it change. It takes a little bit of time. I'm not here where you can see it. It's kind of like magic. All of a sudden it's going to change and it'll just go from one end to the other. There it goes. See it change it? Yeah. And you get a pretty even finish on it. For a minute I thought it was going to make a liar out of me. Yeah. Okay. Does the heating uh, make it just faster or does it make it actually better? I, I think it makes it better. Yeah. I really do. I think it evens it out. If you get an even coat of paint on it, that's the first step. You know, I've got a little bit of a sag in here, so I've got some some deeper wrinkles, I guess, as a result of that. And you can do it multiple times. You know, let it dry, and then go back over it again, and you can, you know, recreate what you already did. Um, the nice part about this is you can set it aside, and in probably a couple of hours it'll be dry. But if you like the wrinkled finish, but you don't like black, you want to, you know, machine gray, we'll spray it over. Just test it on something beforehand, to make sure you don't have incompatibility, otherwise you're going to have the thing peeling and bubbling all over the place. When you do paint with aluminum, and I found this out working on my airplane over the last month, I had an airworthiness directive I had to um, meet and and, uh, and resolve. With aluminum, you probably can wash it with uh, simple green. Simple green is corrosive, but what it does is create an etch. And simple green extreme which is not really available, does not do that. So you can either do it with that, or you can use what they call an alodyne, which uh, etches the surface. So, you know, simple green or alodyne. Now, once you put the alodyne on, you can go with zinc chromate, and then you can wrinkle it, and it will really last. Now, on the Arc 5 radios, which uh, many of us have seen over the years, the uh, finish was never prepared like that. But you can take, I take a little of the hub cap on the end of a, a tray where you put the bearings in. I have a bunch of those around. And I'll take the spray bottle and I'll spray it in that cap. Then I'll take a brush and I'll put it on spots that need to be refinished. You want to make sure you get it in the center of whatever uh, defect it is. Otherwise, you cause, you cause telegraphing because now what you wind up doing is building it up all the way across rather than just filling the spot. Do it a little bit at a time. And uh, I've been able to do it on the R5s and they look beautiful when they're done. Anyways, that's uh, that's that trick. Yeah, oh yeah. You can buy it at any auto parts store. Okay. They use it to wrinkle up the uh, rocker covers yep. on car engines, whatever. So some of the tools that I use, I, I don't know how these wound up in my toolbox. These little right angle tools. There's one that's kind of a sharp bend, and then there's one here that's kind of rounded with a point on it really work out well for digging out leads for um, resistors and capacitors and things like that. I don't believe in cutting off the leads when I restore a radio uh, and then try to butt splice them or anything like that. I know one restorer who I've talked to is well known. He said, I don't want to do that. He said, I don't want to take off the entire lead because I don't want to break a tube socket lead. Well, I've only broken one over the years. But if you also look online at Summit Racing, I don't know why the hot rod is using these things, but maybe a dentist would give, give you some. Are these little pick tools, mm -hmm. the fine little pick tools, they work really great. And not only do they 
pick something off, but then you can take and use this to push through the hole, heat the hole, and, yeah. and put your uh, soldering iron to it, push this through, and now you can get your resistor back through there again. So I also use a hand plunger solder sucker. I don't use uh, the, uh, you know, the copper, what do they call it, uh, solder tape there, whatever solder it is. Wick. What is it? Solder wick? Yeah, solder wick. Yeah, I've never used that. I want a trick to that to use, too. The solder wick, you put a little liquid rosin in the solder wick and then put it on. Suck it right up. Yeah. It's a whole different ball game. Oh, well, that's good. It, it's, it works a lot very well, rather than just using it by itself. Think about that. This, yeah, that, this should be an exchange of information, which is good. These tools are made by Krauts, G-R-I-O-U-T-S. Yeah, G-R-I-O-T-S. Grouch, Grouch Garage. Hot Rodders know about them. Did you ever use a, a soldering um, iron that's got a vacuum? I have one of those as well, but I don't use it on the radios. I use it on my, um, the equipment that I have for repairing scoreboards, which is my company. Okay. And, you know, sucking the solder out the, all the pins, the solid state devices. Mm -hmm. um, no, I don't use that. It just doesn't have the volume mm -hmm. and it clogs yeah. too quick. Uh -huh. So. You wind up chasing yourself. Buffing and buffing compounds and things like that. This is an aluminum cover off a of VFO on a Valiant. And it's usually my signature. If you see a Valiant or a Ranger that's been restored and you see a polished VFO cover, it's probably one that I did. I have to take the VFO cover off anyways, the whole thing off to do what I need to do to, uh, <clears throat> you know, restore it and check it. So I put that on a buffing wheel with some buffing rouge. It really comes out kind of nice. But you can also do it by hand using this product called Simicron. And that's available, I think, online. And probably, <clears throat> you know, auto parts stores might have some in a small tube. Stop me at any point if you need a question answered. Um, I still got a cold left over. One of the other things I do is. I have packaged up for most of the joints and stuff and column stuff, capacitor kits. So these kits here are custom made and this one's for a ranger. So if you were doing these back in the day and you were building one, you would have in the kit a capacitor like this. I don't make them anymore. <laughs> this is brand new. You know what they've done. They've stuffed them. Mm -hmm. Okay. But these will fit right back in place to the original dimensionally. If you were trying to do this with two separate capacitors yourself, you'd find it very difficult to do, particularly in the uh, Valiant. Now, this is the Valiant one here. There's uh, two 15 15s at 450, so they're dual caps. And then there's two 80 microfarad at 450s in here. And then all the capacitors that you need to replace the paper capacitors as well. These are available through a guy by the name of Mark Olson, KE9PQ. He's all over eBay. <coughs> Part of the kit also is to get that to mount it with. I try to use the old metal ones instead. Kind of looks like the original. One. <laughs> it's kind of hard to, to, you can't find the original. So every one that I get that's old, I take it off and modify it if I need to to make it fit. I wonder if you go to an automotive store and you might have metal. Circular clips like that? Yeah. I don't know. I'm only going to think of as clamps, but I don't know. Be interesting to check out. Hmm. One of the other things that uh, a lot of people encounter, particularly on the Johnson equipment, is refinishing the knobs. And this one here has been polished with a semi-chrome. It works pretty well. And a new pointer installed. And I'll give this to look at. And here's an original one. Let me pass that around. We needed a rainy day to get a lot of people in here. <laughs> but it's so nice. Who wants to be inside? Is that polish come off rather easily? Or is there really a lot of elbow grease to get that polish back off again once you start going? No, it doesn't take, take very much to get it off. You know, the, it's it's tedious because if you look at the grooves in there, right. you've got to use your fingernail to get in there and clean out the polishing compound afterwards. Or 
you can use a screwdriver and a piece of cloth and work it in. After you do 13 or 14 knobs on a valiant in one sitting, <laughs> my hands are like this. Oh, it is tedious. So how do you make those pointers? That's what everybody asks me. Huh? They call me, have you got pointers? No, I'll show you how to make them. Thank you. First of all, and I thought, yeah, I do. Okay. Most of the old pointers, come on, yeah. you know, and they're kind of yellowy and they don't look very nice. So one of the first things I do after I take them out is I drill a hole with a one-eighth drill. Yeah, that one's been drilled out. So that's got a new, I want to clear it. I want to clear that hole. I want to make sure they get the glue out of it. And then you can go to a hobby shop or you can go online and they make one eighth inch polystyrene rod. This is made by Evergreen Scale Models, one eighth inch rod. So then, oh, there we go. I'm trying to find one that's already been opened up. You know you're not going to use all of it, so just cut whatever you think. Half inch is fine. Now sometimes this rod is not always consistent in its diameter, so you find that you have to maybe wobble the hole a little bit or add a little glue to the end, a little contact cement. You can force them sometimes, but you'll also eventually crack the knob. It may not show up right away, okay? But I wind up putting it on the table, and that one fit right in, okay? Now, how do I get it down to size? Well, that's still pretty long. So I kind of know where I want to be. I don't want to do this forever. Okay. Two-sided circuit board. can be anything. A little tape on the edge kind of protects the knob when you're rubbing it on the surface. And I'm going to take and put some 180-grit paper on it easier. Like that. Now, the knob, you want to try to keep it as close to the edge of where the circuit board is, because otherwise it's going, to, it's going to bevel it at an angle. So as you bring it down, you can start out here somewhere like this. It doesn't matter. But as you bring it down to size, you want to make sure you're close, but not enough that you're going to rub the edge against the white marker, because the edge will cut into it. So there we go. You can hear it sort of. The knob is starting to rub really well on the uh, on the masking tape. Oops, almost got away. And you'll know when you're done, because you won't see any more of it coming off. And obviously, you can do a bunch of those in pretty short order. Yeah. And you can make an old-looking face look pretty nice with the knobs with nice white pointers. And they'll all be the same height. Because the trick is, it's the thickness to here that you want. You can build it up, or you can get something that works just perfect for you. Okay, this is one that I like to do. This is an ART13 knob. And they've got a lot of fine markings on them. But this is good for any knob that has markings on it. Chicken head knobs that have the little stripe down the middle. You say, oh, things are grungy, they're yellow either. They don't exist. This is a paint that I got at um, one of the, one of the uh, craft stores. I'm trying to think of the name of it is Michael's. Okay. It's called Liquitex Acrylic. Heavy body titanium white. It's it's water base. Okay? So you don't wind up having a mess. So this is Howard Mills trick. Howard taught me this. And he said you take, you know Howard at all? The name, ring a bell? Very known water restorer down in Virginia. 
very much a gentleman. Pull on your thumb. And you're going to rub it across the markings. Just like that. Okay? Rub it in. Make sure you get, get it covered. You don't have to put it on very thick. And we're going to just set that aside for a minute. And I'm going to wash the paint off my fingers. And if I get this on my pants, my wife is going to kill me. Yeah, oh yeah, until it dries. <laughs> and it's a new pair of pants. So you can see it. You're doing this at home with the kitchen sink, and your wife's saying, "What are you doing? <laughs> Messing up everything and rinsing off white paint." It doesn't take long for that to dry. And you just need a little bit of dampness on the towel. You don't need it drenched. And of course, the deeper the markings, the more paint they're going to take, the longer they're going to dry. So you can take the stuff off on the surface pretty quickly. That's one wipe. <laughs> there weren't any markings there to begin with. And you'll find it, you know, if you rub it too much, some of the old coloring of the knob is going to show through. But, you know, again, it, it, time, it takes a little time and some practice mm -hmm. to get it right. So I've rubbed that a little too much, a little wet. But you get the idea. Yeah, there's a span of it that's pretty good right in there. So questions that you might have. What are you restoring? What are you thinking about restoring? What have you seen? Or What could I do about me doing the face on it? There's a couple of spots where I think, well, maybe I can just paint over that, but then is that going to show up like a sort of it, it will. It's almost uh, impossible to blend colors like that because even with the Valiants, for example, that I've done so many more over the years, people say, well, can I have some touch-up paint? I said, you know, first of all, they were running those on an assembly line type production line, and on any given day, the color might have been a little different. And somebody might have gone might have gone a little heavier, so that maroon might be a darker maroon, and it might be a lighter maroon. So the gray in the face, same thing. That's going to darken with age. You try to put something to it; it's very hard. You can't really go to an automotive store, a uh, paint store like Sherwin Williams, and have them match it. They can come close, but again, it's going to always look a little funny. The problem is that if you want to match colors. Today, they have a way of doing that, but you have to have a clear coat finish on it. So your car has a clear coat finish. They have a gauge or a tool of some sort that can actually focus on the paint and determine what the paint color actually is, and it comes pretty darn close. They have to for the body shops. So that's what they do there. So that's why you really can't match colors very well. Um, I have a standard color I use all the time. It, it's not a perfect match to what I think. Uh, they probably had back then, but it's as close as anybody's going to get. And when it's all together, who knows the difference? Because you, you have to put one that was brand, an old one next to it that was in perfect condition to be able to tell. And I've got two of those that have never had a scratch on them. I don't know how that happened, but I actually had one that had still had the shipping block in it underneath and the spare, spare fuses, spare parts. So um, anyways... Um, so I lost my thought there on that one. So you could get spray paint then at these auto places that will try to come close? You could go there. 
and pick a color. Or pick, pick one that's already. Yeah, the, they'll have shots for different automobiles, and you can have to match it up with them. And those don't often often match up very well. Um, but if you're going to overspray everything, then use a spray gun. Then I use a and I water it. I think it's a 400. It's a professional spray gun. And you're going to need a compressor and all of that that goes with it. It gets to be an expensive uh, proposition. I bought paint about two months ago, and paint prices have gone off out of the roof, off the roof, out of the roof, whatever, um, through the roof. When I walked out of there, I thought I had three hundred dollars worth of paint, seven hundred eighty-nine dollars, and it was crazy. Yeah, well, I mean, I had a quart of uh, a couple of quarts of paint, and then I had the hardener for the paint, and then I had the clear coat. Things are just so crazy expensive. And I don't know that that will do much more than four or five faces, maybe. So, you know, this is where I say the part of what this is about. How much is too much and how far do you go? What's it worth? What's the price point for a restored Valiant or a restored Ranger? Now, typically on a restored Ranger, I get $1,195. You say, oh, shit, $1,195 or $1,400 for a Valiant. Well, if you understood the time it takes and the materials it takes to do it. And then you take what it was worth back in the day and try to, in, in today's dollars, what it was worth, it probably isn't too far off. Mm -hmm. So there are people that like things very nice, well done. I have one in a finished cellar. I have a Valiant and a 75A4, both of them restored. And they look nice, and they're on a very nice table. So it makes a nice presentation. You know, if it was all beat up, it probably wouldn't be nearly as uh, nice to look at. And, May not be in the house at all. My wife may have to get it out of here. It looks like junk. So painting is, a, is an art in itself, and it's a whole different business. Now, what's happened over the years is we're all getting older. Unfortunately, I was discussing with somebody this morning how as I get older and I look back, there's a lot looking back, but there ain't much looking forward. You know, there's, I'm on the back nine. And a lot of guys who are doing what I do, and there aren't a lot of people doing it, you know, there's a lot of knowledge here that's uh, getting lost with time. Uh, part of my business involves the restoration electrically or electronically, and the other part is the aesthetics of it. And I don't mind doing either one. I like doing them all together, do the, the face, the case, the whole nine yards, so that when it gets done, it makes a nice presentation and it reflects what I think is a quality job. But some people don't care. They just want it fixed. And that's okay. I get it. So I don't mind doing that. I go through, replace all the capacitors usually, check all the resistors, and you'll see some of the old resistors. They look like they're atrophied right away. Oh, because if they're physically changed in size, they're probably physically changed in value. So out the window they go. And they aren't that expensive, but it does take time. If you're going to take... The resistors out or the capacitors out, and you're going to actually take the ends off of the terminal where they're mounted to and do it the right way. I call it the right way. Somebody else might say that's not the way I do it. But I want it to look like it was done properly, and that it's going to last. I don't want something that was butt spliced because there was a lot of heat involved going like this. I want things braced also. I don't want capacitors, uh, for example, on a, on a Ranger. There's a 700 microfarad capacitor. I'm sorry. It's, it's a 700 volt capacitor. In fact, it's right here in front of me. It's, um, I think it's 10 microfarad. 10 microfarad, 10 microfarad 700 volt. And it's supposed to be mounted to actually a, a standoff stud from a transformer mount. If you don't, it's going to sit there and do this. Well, it's going to break off in, in transit. The other thing is shipping stuff. Oh, I'm sorry. Good segue. My business involves scoreboards, and we ship scoreboards in from the manufacturer in South Dakota, and we ship stuff out from our office as well, small stuff. But the scoreboards come in from um, South Dakota, and uh, they come in on a, a dedicated flatbed that we have chartered, I guess you could say, to do the work for us to get them here in one piece. The uh, LTL character, uh, carriers really beat us up pretty good. UPS is a problem. Um, I have found less problems with FedEx. Somebody might say it's the other way around. But what I've done is lately 
I'd go to FedEx and I'd say, it's your problem. I want you to pack this so it doesn't get damaged. I'm going to insure it for full value. When it gets to the other end, I'm not going to worry about the customer because you're the shipper. If I'm the shipper, I'm the guy that's going to have to deal with the heartbreak for me and for the owner and trying to rectify it and get it back to me. I've had some real battles with UPS, FedEx, not so much. Back in the day, I look at that Valiant that I have that had the uh, wood block in the bottom of the chassis to brace it up under the power transformer so that it wouldn't bend the chassis or get damaged in shipping. Those are the days in the 50s when people took pride in what they shipped and they wanted to get there in one piece. So everybody that handled it handled it you know, with, with some degree of care. Forklifts weren't really around to do that work. So a lot of it got moved by hand and by pump up hand trucks and things like this. They weren't bashing things up. Today, it's all about moving the freight in the fastest, most efficient manner possible. And if it gets damaged, I had one guy come in from uh, one of the companies, could have been consolidated for anyways back in the day, or it might be uh, Old Dominion now, came in and said to me, oh, we got the lowest damage rate, 2% in the whole industry. I said, I looked at him and I really let him have it. I said, that doesn't sit well with me because when mine gets damaged in that 2% level, it, you know, your lower your lowest rate does absolutely nothing for me because all we do is get damaged equipment. That's why we charter or we uh, contract with uh, private carriers to bring the scoreboards to us now because we know they're going to put it on that flatbed and it's going to go from there to there, there, from there to here, and it's not going to be transferred from one truck to another and forklift three times. So for shipping is a real issue. Uh, Valiants don't ship well. I had one that a fellow sent in one time. These are things that you learn. And the first time you learn, you, you make uh, adjustments. <clears throat> it came to me in the power transformer, which is only held on by those little tin legs, had torn off and gone right clear across the whole back of the uh, chassis. So it took out a couple of 6146s, the uh, choke on there, all the way to the other end. It was a disaster. Turned out it was the guy's father's Valiant. He said, and I said, I, it's going to take me a lot of time to straighten this thing out. I think when I got done, it was like $2,500. Hour upon hour upon hour. Time and materials. And he got it back in one piece. Uh, I had another situation, which I, was kind of a funny situation in a way, where a guy sent me the RF deck for a Johnson 500. Came in in perfect condition. I did it all over, the face, the cabin, the whole nine yards. I sent it back to him. In the back of my mind, I had this little worry. Where's the power supply? What's going on with that? I'm only seeing half of the uh, patient here. About two years later, he called me up. He said, I finally decided to made up the power supply with the RF deck, and it doesn't work. Now he's going to have to send me, and he did, the whole power supply and the RF deck back to match it up so that both of them worked at the same time. This whole thing started with a phone call, and when I sent him back the RF deck, I, he, he sent me back an email when he got that. And it started off something to the effect of, this is the worst thing that ever happened to me. And I was like, what the hell happened? That's the best looking piece I've got in the whole place. Everything else I got looks like junk. <laughs> so anticipating Bad turned out to be good. He was a good guy, and he had suffered a lot of issues with that that set um, as a result of not having the opportunity to put both together at the same time. So all kinds of stories like that, you know, war stories, if you wish. But again, going back to shipping and valiance, I don't know why anybody could ship anything and not have that damaged. If you'd, you'd have to – I've done wooden crates. I've done foam. I've done – Peanuts, I've done bubble wrap. The ranges, I can get it. I can do that. I've shipped two ranges in the last month, and I got away with it. <laughs> I have a FedEx do it and say, please, cushion the face, double box it, do whatever you need to. Call the customer. Customer gives them a credit card. All on them. You know, I don't need to take that you risk. Pull the tubes out of those? I, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I pull the tubes out and I wrap them in bubble wrap, put them in a separate box. Okay, that's, that's you know. I'd rather, I'd rather not have to have anybody open something like that up to do that, but 
and there's no other way to do it. You know, you know that was a case of where I, I did leave the 6146 in place because there's the cap that goes on the top of the 6146, and it's a very solid piece of wire going down a little bit of a, a solder lug. If I had taken the 6146 out, that would have bounced all the way to wherever it was going and broken off. And the guy would already start with a sort of little bit of a negative attitude about, oh, look at this. You know, but the 6146 is it's pretty well locked in anyways. It wasn't an issue. You you know, I usually have taken a picture for the customer of what it looks like anyways before it ships. Not because I want to be able to reference it to, you know, damage, uh, which I probably should do, but um you know, they know what they're getting before they get it. Um, one of the things I do with the Valance and the range, of course, is get into the VFO and change that resistor in there. It's an 18K resistor and change that to, uh, oh, it's a, I think it's a 2 watt. I change it to a 10 watt because they have a tendency to cook and change value. And there's also a 470 ohm resistor right beside it that probably is damaged as well. So that uh, takes a little time to get that box apart and then put it back together. And of course, then you have to realign the VFO in the end. Um, one thing I want to show you is what the extent of work is in doing one of these faces. This is a ranger face that I've done. I start off by sandblasting the face, and once that's done, it reveals the spot welds on the face because they've spot welded on the back side some reinforcements to tie the face to the cabinet. So. When they did it at the factory, they used a red lead primer. And red lead is fairly heavy. And they can block sand it and hide all those imperfections. On the back side here, you can see all the bracing. There's three pieces in the spot well, so I think four or five here. There's a couple here, a couple over here. So once this is cleaned up, then I'll prime it with... Um, well, first of all, I'll take all those spot walls and I have some very fine putty that I use. It's like an auto body putty, but it's very, very fine. And I'll spot those in and then block them. And then I'll hit it with a self-etching primer you can get at Home Depot. Then three coats of sanding primer, grade high bill primer, block that. Then I'll paint in this case here. There's a range of face. Then I'll take and paint the overall um, in this case, let me see it, paint the overall maroon and then come back and mask the maroon and paint the overall, the other part of the gray. So it's a two-step operation. Once the gray is, or the, once the maroon is painted on, I'll wet sand it. And then I'll turn around, put the gray on, wet sand it. Once it's all wet sanded, then it'll go out to the silk screener. It'll silk screen it. Then it'll come back to me. I'll put the clear coat on it and wet sand and buff it. So that's where you get the mirror finish. So you say, well, why can't you do it in a dull finish like the original? It's very difficult to do a dull finish if you don't have a professional setup where you've got air moving and you've got almost no dust particles available to, to land on it. And all this is, it's acrylic enamel. They did it in the old days with lacquer. Lacquer would be very easy to work with. You can't get it anymore. So you have to work with acrylic enamel. And acrylic enamel is a dust magnet. So that's why I have to wet sand it in between. And that's why I have to clear it, because when I go to clear it, that's going to take care of all the imperfections. But at the same time, the clear sucks up dust. So that's why it gets wet sanded and buffed. I think it makes a pretty presentation. In, in, you know, when you set it there, different people like different things. So some like it and some don't. Some say, well, it's not original. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Different strokes are different folks. And the cabin is painted maroon with a clear coat on it as well. That's all been sandblasted down to nothing. So this is my dilemma. I've gotten to the point now where the fellow that did the silk screen for me down in Virginia got T-boned by an 18-wheeler and a little pickup truck one day. And he survived it. And it took months for him to get back on his feet. And he's a diabetic, and he's had a lot of issues with his wrists, and he's had fused, fused bones in his wrist, one thing or another. Essentially, he said, I'm not going to do it anymore. And he was very good doing it. And he used a, he had a, what they call a vector format 
for the face is all the artwork. So it, on the computer, it looks very small, but you can blow it up to any dimension. But I know what he did. He'd get it dimensionally about right, and then he would move the silk skin around to make sure it registered properly every time he stroked it with the ink. Well, I've done silk screening, and I don't want to do it again. And I really have a problem trying to find someone who kind of does this and has had experience doing it, doing it at home, doing onesies, twosies, you know. If I go to a, a professional sheet metal finisher, he's going to say, oh, we can do 100 for you, and it'll be $1,000. But if I do two for you, it's going to cost you 500 we do. Am I at the end of the rope with this? You know, you know, you look at factors, a whole, whole lot. I am at this point. How much more am I going to do this? I don't know. You know, but I've got a few left. Well, I'm thinking that they have better ways to do it these days. So maybe you might be right. They might have a way to, you know, shoot ink down on the surface, like an inkjet printer or something like that. And the trouble, trouble with that is you got to get the colors right. You know, again, I know what the ink, what the ink colors are. I can define them and get them. But um, again, it's just so labor intensive to do one of those. I have a few left that I can. I don't do that many in the course of a year, so it's not a big deal. Um, so that's that's what's involved in the refinishing. Now, this is typically this well, this conversation is more about Johnson, but there are other manufacturers, radios that you can do very similar things too. Certainly the cabinets, but if you, you know, if you're considering painting a cabinet with a rattle can, you don't have it come out very well. If you want to get something powder coated, that's a really neat way to do it. And I've done a lot of the uh, range of two cabinets with a powder coat. The trick is when you go to a powder coater, it's just like everything else, a minimum charge. And I, it was funny, I brought them over. I think I had three, I, well, I had a range of cabinets, two of them. And I had a, um, an Invader 2000 and an Invader 200. Well, I started off, I brought two cabinets over. Then I realized I had two more. So when I brought the two over, I said, what's the cost? $250. Then I brought the other two. Now I got four. What's the cost? $250. <laughs> so I, I learned very quickly that this is probably a ceiling to that minimum charge. But if you have a bunch of stuff to do all at once, now if you want to have them powder-coated, and you want it, well, you want a color, let's say you want a gray, they probably have two, a light and a dark gray. They don't have specific colors. You can't get a maroon, you can get a red, you can get a black, you can get a green, maybe two greens. If you don't like the color, get it done in black, and then get somebody like an auto body shop to just do it in the color you want. Now you've got a really durable finish in the color you want with an even coat of paint. Well, why not take it to the body shop all and have them do it? Well. Part of the problem there is it's, you know, we don't do this kind of thing. You know, you have to sandblast it, you know, get prepped and everything. If you can do that and then get it to the, just sandblast it and get it to the powder coater, you're going to have a nice finish when you get done. So that's my story. What can I help you with or what can you help me with? <laughs> Go ahead. I don't know if we've ever run into this problem before, but you have like a signal generator or something that's got a, plastic pointer on it, you know, with a line down the middle. Yeah. And I found that I had one like that. What I do is I had a jewel case from my CD that was clear. Yeah. And I wanted very carefully cutting out, you know, the shape of it. I think I had to, like, sand it on the edges. Of right. The pile of the thing. And then I took a, not an exact one, but a utility knife, and I just went right Squirt down it. the middle. Yeah, a groove. You know, you bring up a good point, too. When I was showing you this, what you could do with the paint, on the, the dial marker for the, for the Ranger, Rangers and Valiants, Johnson Ranger and Valiants, there's a white line. Most of the time, it's some of it's eradicated. You know, it's pieces are missing or it's yellowed. You could do the same thing with this white paint on that groove. And on the groove you're talking about, you can rub it in with your thumb, let it dry, and with a damp cloth, wipe it off. And you get a really nice, and you can do it in different colors. Now, on the 500, they have a funny knob over on the right to move the meter switch. And it doesn't have a pointer on it. And you really have to use the handle as the alignment point. It's round with a little uh, handle on it. You really don't really know where it is. So what I do is I drill a hole in it 
not a hole, just a, a detent in it and directly across from the handle. And I take a little red paint coming in. Now I know exactly where it is. You know, might not be original, but <laughs> if it functions, yeah. So if you know anybody that's doing silk screen work, well, you know, I just don't want to get into that myself. You know, I do. There's enough involved in trying to get it to the point of doing the silk screen, without doing that any further. Well, I just about covered everything here as I, I have. If I can point out to you, I don't know if this is dry yet or not. But that's pretty cool. Just a short period of time. That's not shiny at all. Take a look at it. It's pretty much finished. I'm thinking that it's it'll make it so it's not shiny. So yeah, I mean that's a, that's as flat as you can get it. It'll match an R5. Again, that's only one coat too. You yeah. you may have some some of it showing the metal showing through. You mean the uh, wrinkle finish? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I think if you put more coats on it, I think it would eat into what's there and kind of bubble up a little more. Um, I think this is probably about as as fine a wrinkle as I've ever seen. I think if I put another layer on and really, really lay it on there, it'll wrinkle up really much more. Yeah. It, you know, it's one of those things you have to try it out. Right, right, yes. You know. I've got a card here, a business card, with my phone number on it. Um, my email, if you would like it, is chuck at scoreboardenterprises.com. You can call me anytime. People call me from all over the country. Sometimes they want advice, or and I give the advice freely. Other times they want things fixed, and we talk about it and determine what the value of it is. I've got a lot of people that call me about Viking Valiant, not Viking Valiant, Viking 2s that want them refinished. And again, this goes back to the other part of what I'm talking about here today is how far is too far? Well, if you want to do a Viking 2 face, that's the one that probably probably one of the best AM transmitters they've made, have the separate VFO, was basically crystal operated. They're a really nice unit. They're very heavy, but they're bulletproof. They're not worth anything. You know, there was a guy who had one today for fifty dollars out here. Are you gonna spend three hundred and seventy five dollars to do a face for a radio that you can buy all day long for less than two hundred dollars working? That's where you have to balance it. How desirable is a aftermarket part of it? Maybe you don't care about the aftermarket part of it. Maybe you want something nice for yourself. Yeah. So, you know, I I've done a couple of them. Um but it's just not a lot of demand to do those. And I don't have any backup faces that I can, you know, rotate. Yeah. Yeah. What was the email again? Chuck at scoreboard? Enterprises.com. Yeah. Give you a little background information, a lot of information as to how I got to this point in my life. I started out as a kid working at a radio and TV shop. Then I worked in an all-body shop. So I knew something about fixing radios. I actually paid my way through college doing that. And then worked at the all body shop when I was in college as well. So um, I became a math teacher. And I taught high school math in the town of Easton, Mass, for 12 years. The principal of the school asked me if I could fix the school board in the gym. He thought, you know, he knew that I could fix a lot of things. He said, maybe if you fix that, we can move on. When I got off the ladder, the athletic director said, why don't you do that? Nobody does that. That was exactly 50 years ago. And, and it started to move on its own, kind of, the word got out. And then I went from place, and I was kind of a shy kid. I didn't really know, what, what am I going to do, go into another town and people I don't know? I'm kind of in the school where I kind of feel good. 
and I'm confident about what I'm doing, I get out there and wind up on a ladder on a football field and fixing a scoreboard. So then I thought, well, I'll make a summer uh, job out of this. When I'm out of school, I'll go out and set things up ahead of time. Nobody ever did this before and check them all out and get them ready for the season. And I'll deal with the season as it comes along. And then I would jump in my car after school and I'd go fix stuff till I remember having lights on the scoreboard for my car to try and fix it at night. The next thing you know, I went up in Boston Garden, Fenway Park, the old Schaefer Stadium. Now we run, there are 10 people and we're putting up, well, we get 253 footers that come in uh, about every two weeks, loaded with scoreboards to put up video boards, all of that. So that's forced me into being able to repair a lot of the solid stage stuff because a lot of what was there originally was mechanical. Stepping relays, the old Boston Garden work that way. They went, tick, 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 boom. That's like that. And I converted that to solid state in 1981. So along the way also, um, I also became uh, chairman of the board of a $1.5 billion bank, mutual bank. So that was another experience. I'm a charter captain, and I have a 40-foot uh, Cabo sport fisherman. And I do a lot of offshore fishing in the canyons. And I'm an instrument rated private pilot and have an aircraft as well that I maintain myself. So between having a business and all this other stuff, I do this. What did you go to college for? Excuse me? What did you go to college for? Math. I was a math teacher. Okay, sorry. All right. The key, I think the central part of it, if somebody would ask me what, you know, what is the core of what I do, it's called logic. Yeah. I can see the natural progression of things yeah. and how to fix things. And I tell people, and, and I told my son, my son works for me now, and we'll take the business over this year. So if you look at things, things will tell you, they will talk to you, and they will tell you how they wore in and how they were put together. And he, there were a few lessons learned putting clutches together and things like that in cars. Among, among other things, I built three um, AC Cobra kit cars, actually four. I'm sorry, four of them. So mechanical things, electrical things. <laughs> I'm just addicted. Have you built any radio kits? Any like an holocraft or anything or any of that kind of stuff or not? I'm sorry? Have you built any kits? Like oh, years ago, I built stuff? yeah, I built a Heath kit and I built a night kit. But I, I'll tell you honestly, uh, until I got to be, well, six, well, high school, I never saw any of this Johnson stuff or anything. You know, I got into life trappings of school and family and all of that. Mm -hmm. And it was only about 15, 20 years ago that I spotted a Johnson transmitter and, and rebuilt it, fixed it. And I said, oh, I can do this. And I used to buy them all here. They don't exist anymore. Nobody's selling anything like that anymore. Nobody wants it. So, anyways, that's the story. And I know they're on him. Anything else I can help?